see it. Okay, so we are on the elbow and radio ulna joint. This is posted on Moodle. I'm doing my best to show it on the projector. However, the fine details you may need to just pull up uh, for those of you watching uh, at home, work, or later on. Um, I also do want to remind everybody, uh, sorry, my brain is uh, different. Uh, and that's okay, if it is okay. Look, the 415 project template is here. They have a lot of questions answered. Remember guys, very open-ended presentation style. I don't care. It's whatever works best for you to present me the material. Word, PowerPoint, Prezi, YouTube, VoiceThread, Venmo, you know what? <laughs> whatever, uh, whatever works. So it, it, I'm, I'm not picking up that. All right. Okay, let's see how I did this. I can't remember how I did this. This is so frustrating. Oh, uh, me and technology. Okay, guys, let's talk about your elbow and radial ulna joint circles and uh, function. So, just like the previous uh, joints, this is all about how they cross. You have everything you need to know in the verbiage. This muscle pulls this way, this muscle pulls that way. This, so even if you're not a circler, you have that information. In addition, guys, especially on your final. One way, if you're not sure if you're going to pass this class, is to show me you know something. So on the final, just like previous tests, when I hand out scratch pieces of paper, give me something. These are the flexors. These are the extensors. These are the, let me know you know something. I'm not saying you don't, but that's a great tiebreaker. <laughs> if, if I'm trying to find a way to help you and you show me that you at least knew the muscles and how they pull and maybe the questions confuse you, but you, you gave me something that's very helpful. It's just that, and it's not one person. This is 310, this is 415, but a lot of times when there's ambiguity, I don't really have anything to work with so that we could work through those, those, those problems. So just on the final, give me something. And Santa might be able to do something for you if you at least show me you know these muscles and their functions. Okay, fair enough? Okay, just like the ankle and subtalar, we're going to have two different joints in one circle. But there's a reason for that. Ankle and subtalar, they lived in the same apartment complex even though they were in different apartments. We call that a capsule. They were in the same water balloon at the ankle and the subtalar joint. They were just not on the same level. Remember, one was below the other. Very similar. The elbow and the radiola joint are in the same water balloon, the same joint capsule, but the elbow function is dictated by the bilateral axis, flexion extension in the fetal out of fetal. So look at your little key. Bilateral axis, flexion and extension, now remember, the axis is just showing motion capabilities. And then the muscles pull in those directions of motion. Our AP axis is not applicable, just like in our knee. We don't move our elbow side to side, not normally. If you hurt yourself, you might have what we call valgus and varus movement. But you're not supposed to. And then we have our unique pronation and supination from our polar axis. So our polar axis is gonna be where our polar axis usually is, and that's what's gonna represent this. Okay? You have some muscles that pull on both. So instead of doing two separate circles, where you're just gonna have one axis and another axis and similar muscles, we're just combining it because we can, and it makes it easier. That's one less circle you gotta remember. Pronation and supination. Does anybody remember from 310 in an open chain setting, which bone rotates about the other bone? Very good. Ours. Radius rotates about the ulna. Good. 
So first seed I want to plant is our muscles that are going to influence both elbow and radial ulna are going to be yanking on the radius. Should make sense. The ulna, so like if I'm doing a, a hand analogy, they moved all my bones for those uh, interviews and it's throwing me off. But look, that's why you guys, that's why you guys come to class and that's why I get paid the small bucks. Here's the humerus, here's our ulna. Remember the ulna has that big hook on the end of it, that electronon process, right? Extension, flexion, extension. You know what we don't want? We don't want this. We don't, want, we don't want the ulna to rotate like the radius. We want the ulna to stay snug in there and just move in the sagittal, okay? So what you're going to notice, I'm going to say, hey, this muscle's pulling on the ulna. No radial ulna joint function. This muscle's pulling on the radius. Radial ulna joint function. So I just wanted to, to plant that to see. All right, how is the circle broken up? It's a pretty simple circle because we don't have a frontal plane pull. Our elbow flexors are going to sit in the front of class because remember the anterior of the elbow is a flexion puller. The anterior of our knee was an extension puller, but it's still all about getting you in the feet. Anterior muscles, you're only going to be responsible for three. Biceps break eye, everybody knows that one, super stop. But more important than that one at the elbow is the flexion, is the brachialis. The brachialis is going to be our soleus to the gastroc, that's the biceps break line. Everybody loves the calf because you see it, it's superficial. Like that, there's so much, I don't know, it's just kind of cool. Like somebody who's superficial, a lot of show me. So a lot of superficial muscles are the show me's because that's what people see, <laughs> it makes sense. But sometimes the muscles that are underneath are like, man, I've been carrying this muscle on my back my whole life. Right? Out of sight, out of mind. Brachialis, brachioradialis, biceps break out. Do you notice this trend with brachial? Just this area of the arm, brachial pulse, brachial artery, right? So you get a lot of, uh, you know, some muscles are Latin names, some muscles are origin insertion name, and you know my favorite muscles are the ones that have pull in their name. I think they should all be renamed. Rename them on pull, like the adductor group. Wouldn't this all be simple if all the muscles had pull in their name? Oh, yeah. Extensors, posterior crossing muscles, your triceps brachii, and your enconius. I'm going to show you how those work. You know what's really kind of cool? Quad, four muscles, elbow, you have the three heads of the tricep and the enconius, so you kind of have this little symmetry with the elbow. In fact, if you look at an elbow in an x-ray, it's like, darn, it looks like a knee. The olecranon is just an unevolved, evolves patella. That's really what it is. This is an elbow patella. We had to have an avulsion here so that we could rotate the knee. Because if it was still connected via bone, we, we couldn't spin the knee when we cut and plant. So it's kind of cool. A lot of similarities. All right. Pronation and supination pullers. You guys, Merry Christmas. Pronator teres. Pronator quadratus. Supinator. Where students are going to miss questions is... Can the supinator be responsible for pronation? Absolutely. But it has to be working how? Decentric. The supinator doesn't always supinate you, just like my bicep doesn't always flex me. So having that pull in the name is a blessing and a curse. It's a blessing, metaphorically, if you understand that it's just on direction of pull. But it can be a curse if you're like, oh, supinator, I need to see supination. Make sense? Okay. I'll put those in our rotation circle, just like we've done before, just like we did at the hip. Remember how the hip, we had like a bowl that sit both fences. So because these muscles are in the circle and they're on, so think of it like this. All three of these muscles are on both axes. So there's no flexion extension. They're just in the middle and they're here to party. They're just here to play on the merry-go-round. They're here to have fun on the playground and spin the radio on the joint. Cool? You will have your most challenging muscle. I told you it was coming. 
when I said about how the rectus and anatomical, all of our circles are based off of anatomical and how our rectus and anatomical isn't trying to twist you. But if you twist to the right, it's pulling you back to the left. And if you twist to the left, it's pulling you back to the right. It can have dual function based off of its position. It can't have dual function at the same time. If I'm twisted to the right, it can't pull me to the right. The brachioradialis is one of the only, that one and the pectoralis major. I'm gonna make you learn and understand a dual functioning muscle because I think it's gonna help you in what you do. I'm gonna be patient, I'm gonna give you tons of examples and I'm gonna explain how in anatomical, think of it like this, I wish I had a bat. Why don't I just have random objects? Think of it like this guys, if I had a string attached to this uh, cleaner, I'm sure it's safe. If I pull up, I'm gonna try to rotate this cleaner this way. But if it's here and I pull up, it's trying to rotate it the other way. So in other words, pulling up linearly would create two different spins based on the position of the bottle. True? So the brachioradialis is gonna be similar. Imagine if I took a string and attached it to my thumb. If I'm supinated and pulled that string, it would pull in the direction of pronation, but only till the bottle is upright. And if I'm fully prone, it would pull in the direction of supination, but only until the bottle is upright. Does that make sense? In other words, when I'm pulling on the bottle, once the bottle gets upright, I'm not trying to rotate it at all. I'm just trying to lift it up. And that's what this muscle is going to do. It's trying to spin me to midway to a semi-prone position. I'm going to explain it. I'm just giving you a heads up. Okay. Most all of them are super clean, super easy, and be red, bra red is the, uh, call it the midway muscle because it can switch functions. I started trying to do this where I give a overview of everything, how they all sit together, like how they would sit in class. This, this is like a holistic view of our circles or think of it like this. Our circle is a cross-sectional view of how the students sit in class. This is like a student class photo. <laughs> Smile, picture, picture, okay? None of the muscles that we're gonna learn that function in our elbow and our radiola cross into the wrist. It's just when you're showing a, 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 a school picture, you know, sometimes you get other classes in, in, in the picture. Here's another view, a lateral view of a lot of the muscles that we're going to be talking about. I thought that may be useful just to kind of see how everything is, uh, is relative to each other. Look, I love, I love this view because just the front view, we don't really get an essence for that brachialis, that soleus of the elbow. But when we look from the side, we can see, oh, yeah, look at how that one's underneath. Remember how when we did the lecture on pulleys, how muscles could serve as pulleys, bones could serve as pulleys, a better leverage pull? We're going to see muscle serve as pulleys, and we're going to see bone serve as pulleys for some of these muscles. Let's start easy. Let's start easy. Let's start with muscles that literally have function in their name, okay? Pronator teres and pronator quadratus on the left. I'm gonna show you with my fingers, remember how I used to do the sternocleidal mass I used to show you like how this was trying to do this and this was trying to do that. So pronator teres is going medial to lateral in anatomical position and it's pulling on the radius. So wouldn't it make sense that it would be pulling in a direction of pronation? Has anybody ever done a spine board or has anybody ever seen someone being spine boarded where they have to roll so that they can fit the board, right? It's kind of like that, because if you think about it, if you're supine, that's what supinated means, face forward, face up. And so you're gonna use pronation pullers concentrically to roll the body, put the spine board on, right? So pronation is literally the act of going prone. So a pronation puller pulls in the direction of pronation. 
that pronator teres is going from medial to lateral, pulling on the radius in a direction of pronation. Some of you may say, well, dude, isn't it crossing, you know, it's on the medial epicondyle, is it crossing the elbow? It does cross the elbow, but it's a similar crossing to our IT band. If you guys remember how that IT band crossed laterally and it was meant for extra stability more than anything, very similar. Like, we, we, guys, the ligaments alone don't handle all stability. We rely on muscles for stability and mobility. So, um, so that's why we're not listing it as a prime muscle of our flexor group um, because it's very lateral in its crossing. Um, and so it's not one of our, our, our big daddies. Only for eccentric contractions. So, but it's still going to pull. It's still going to pull in the direction of pronation. So uh, imagine this. I have, uh, I'm doing an exercise with, uh, let's say I have a hammer, right? So in other words, more mass out here. The gravity is trying to supinate me. I need pronation pullers. True. So what I want to show you is, is that my pronator teres and the other pronators are going to make me pronate through concentric. But if I lower it back down, those same muscles are going to let it down through eccentric. But I would still need muscles that are pulling this way to let me go that way. It's always going to pull in the direction of pronation because that's the way the muscle crosses the joint. When you're sleeping, it pulls in the direction of pronation. When you're working, it pulls in the direction of pronation. Eventually, we're all going to die. It still pulls in the direction of pronation. That's why it gets its function. Good clarification question. Guys, pronator quadratus. Love that muscle. Quad, quadratus. We had a, um, a quadratus femoris. It's just a square shaped muscle. That pulls in a direction of pronation. The way I like to look at this one, so ulna to radius, here's my radius, there's my ulna, uh, anchored, moving. This would be like on the spine board. If the pronator teres is trying to roll the body, the pronator quadratus is at the feet. That kind of makes sense? I'm sure this looks silly in the video, riding the, uh, the little horse in front of Walmart. No, well, not if it's an agonist. If it's an agonist, it would literally be taking the radius distally and <laughs> trying to wrap it around the ulna. Absolutely. So, like, like, think of it like this. When we're trying to spin something like the radius over the ulna, we need to cover surface area. We don't want to just pull on one point because the, the distal radius also wraps around. So, we have this distal pulling muscle that's pulling on our distal radius and saying come here then we have a more proximal pronation pulling muscle that's kind of pulling on the main part of the body and then everybody's favorite muscle and guys i'm, I'm gonna make it i'm gonna make you the same deal i made with 310 i'm gonna ask you the follow, uh, it's, it's, it may not word it exactly, but basically it's going to be what's the function of the supinator? And, and it may have like, uh, it, it, I'm going to ask you a supinator question that is meant to make, make sure that you understand that I don't always have to have supination. Heck, when we did this exercise, when we did this one, and we were like, pronator is concentric, pronator is eccentric. I had supination, but I wasn't working the supination. Make sense? Make sense? I had supination when I lowered it down, but I didn't need a supination puller. I needed a pronation puller to work eccentrically to let it down. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, if I, if I turned on my supinators, I would literally like that's the sound that was that was not my voice that was my joints like no, no different than why would I need tricep when I'm lowering it down right I would need I, don't know, I would need flexors to extend through eccentrics so what this class in 310 I, I we did a lot of 
deprogramming us to look at muscles, influence motion through contraction. We're putting in individual muscles, but it's the same concept. And I want to, I want to mention this because I brought it up to 310. Too many times people talk about exercises in a movement. A full range of motion is one movement, but a full range of motion is made of two movements. Does that make sense? Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. And the Lord said, uh, one movement uh, is two movements. Sorry, dude. I watch American Idol, bro, and they got this one gospel singer for me and my wife. And just We never vote, but like, vote for this guy. <laughs> He's incredible. Does everybody understand that in layman's world, we talk about this movement, that movement. But for a full range of motion, it's two movements. We need to understand that those two separate movements aren't because of different muscles, but there's two different contractions that go into the whole range of motion. That's important. Not for my dad, not for your uncle, not for the person at Reds who, who understands the bro science. That's not what this is about for us. We need to understand how this works. So when you have your ass muscle from study, for example, mm -hmm. and you ask this last test for some more questions of identify two agonists mm -hmm. and an agonist for supination. I would not say that. Okay. Because an agonist is a muscle doing a job. Okay. How I would ask that, that, that question is not identify two muscles for supination. It would be identify two supinators, muscles that pull in the direction of supination, or give you context with an exercise to say, um, what identify two muscles that made this happen. External force trying to pronate me. I need supinators. Therefore, I need the supinator and the other muscles that I'm going to teach you about. So it's not about identify two muscles that do a specific motion. I need context. I, I don't know if those muscles are working or not. What I can always say is they always pull that way, but the motion is going to be totally dictated on the agonist and the contractions. We have to have all three. Look, this right here, we have to have all three components to truly make sense of what's happening during human movement. Muscles influence motion through contraction. So for your question, which was a great, great question, I can't say which muscles are influencing this motion without having the context of the contraction, which would be the exercise itself. Does that make sense? So the way you phrase it was great because it's a learning experience. I can't just say these muscles did this motion. I need context. What was the exercise? What was gravity trying to do? What was the exercise trying to do? Then I can identify the agonist. Then I can identify emotion, and now we can talk contraction. Have to have all three. Cool? Look at that supinator, you guys. Oh, God, I get so geeked up about this stuff. So when you're in anatomical, you can see how those pronation pullers are like ready to go. But when you're fully prone, the supinator is finally now being lengthened. It's like, ah, oh, I can unwrap you. It's hard to see that in a picture that's here, but when you wrap, you can see how that supinator would wrap around that radius and try to unwrap, try to pull you supine, trying to roll you from being face down to face up. This is how the supinator works with my little finger analogies. It's lateral, so it's pulling like this. Remember, my pronator teres is pulling medially, pronator quadratus pulling medially, but my supinator is pulling laterally. Guys, it's named supinator. We got this. The supin, let me ask you this, if I ask you this question, the supinator is called the supinator because it supinates the radial joint. Would you say that's true or false? Good, false. It can, but it doesn't always have to. Heck, when you're working isometrically, it's not doing motion, but it's always pulling that way. All right.
bless you. The brachialis, you guys, this is a powerhouse of an elbow flexor. How do I know it's an elbow flexor? Because it crosses the elbow and it crosses in the front, it crosses anteriorly. The brachialis is deep to the biceps brachii. That's why it never gets any low. But the biceps brachii is on its back, piggybacking on top, using it as a pulley. The biceps brachii gets all the glory. And this muscle, I'm doing a lot of work. This muscle pulls on the ulna. So do you think it's going to have any radial ulna joint pull? Very good. No. Which is actually good. What well, good? Good for it as its function. Think of it like this, guys. So radial ulna joint, because it can move. And not only that, guys, it's pure rotation. It's not hard to spin something. When you're rotating a bunch of kids on the merry-go-round, that thing may weigh a thousand pounds, but you can move it because it's rotational. There's no linear work involved. I can take dumbbells, 100-pound dumbbells. Okay, I can take 50-pound dumbbells. I can't do this with them, but I can do this with them. Does that make sense? Okay. So the point is, is that the, you, the muscles that are influencing elbow and radio ulna, it's kind of like they're on skates. Because it doesn't take a lot of force to spin the radio ulna joint in, in, in activities as they live in. It's like trying to pull on something, but you yourself are on roller skates, and so you can't pull too much because you may start rolling. Brachialis, don't have to worry about that. The brachialis could literally choose as much force as it wants and not have to worry about secondary motion at the radio ulna joint. Very powerful elbow flexion pull. And why is it a flexor? Because it crosses the elbow in the front. Simple as that. Good old biceps freak eye. Now, what in the world did I do this? Oh, yeah, for the biceps freak eye. I didn't need to do this with part. All right, guys, let's talk biceps break eye. The biceps break eye is like your gastrocnemius in that it crosses the joint on top and it crosses the joint below. In fact, the biceps break eye, guys, has three. I did. Uh, I should have put it. No, I think I did. I put it's a flexion puller because it crosses the elbow in the front. Somebody look at your, your specific muscle list. It's a supination puller. I'm going to explain how. It's kind of tricky, but I'm going to explain how. And it functions at the shoulder. Like There's a lot of stuff happening here in the biceps. We'll get to the shoulder stuff when we get to the shoulder stuff. The easy one to see, hopefully, is flexion pull. Okay. Now, this, you see how it looks like it forks? This is not a tendon. That's more of an aponeurosis. That's, that's more of a proprioceptive tissue that's meant to give feedback on where the other bone and stuff is. So in other words, it's not necessarily like a rope. The rope is pulling on the rings. The tendon itself is pulling on the rings. And my job is to get you to see how it is a supination puller. And I think that's why I have this muscle right here. Yes. I mean, this picture. If everybody could come to that um, supination pronation picture, do you see that little bony knob on the radius? Guys, the easy way to tell the radius, it has a literal circular head. And that head is going to rotate on its pillow while it flops its feet across the bed and back. Radial head. It's just spinning. Bony notches and condyles and tuberculates and trochanters, all that is is just extra bony leverage for muscles to yank on. That's all it is. It, it helps the muscle with its leverage to pull. The bicep inserts on that little bony knot. 
Okay. I think they, 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 they have a name for it. It's like uh, the radio tuberosity or something. Sometimes what's cool is sometimes you'll have one bone that has a proximal and distal end, and you'll already have a name for one thing. So when it comes to a similar thing on the other side, you got to call it something different. That's why sometimes things are tubercle, sometimes tuberosity. Just sometimes you got to call it something different when it's on the same bridge length. All right, guys. Let's get our thinking caps on. This is what I need you to see. And I'm still frustrated that they took all of my bones out of here um, when they were doing those interviews, but that's okay. We're going to make it work. Imagine this is the radius. This is the head of the radius. And this projection is that bony knob. We're good? Watch this. This is really cool. When you pronate, you see how that bony knob is going to rotate like this? So if I have a muscle that's pulling on that bony knob, wouldn't it want to pull in the direction of supination? The bicep is pulling on this bony knob. And when I pronate, I literally wrap the bicep into the inside, and it's basically trying to unwrap itself. Does that make sense? <coughs> and hopefully this is gonna help you see it. All right, everybody, let's do, we, we all did this when we were kids. One, one arm, I want you to take, trust me, right or left hand, do this. With the other hand, I want you to put your hand on your bicep. And then I want you to pronate and supinate and feel how that muscle shortens and lengthens while you do it. You feel it shortening and lengthening? You're not moving your elbow. You move with your radial arm joint. And when you pronate, you should feel that muscle get thicker. And when you supinate, you should feel that muscle get shorter because it's pulling in the direction of supination. It's cool. There's a lot of functional movements that involve flexion and supination. There's one functional movement that I do every weekend. It's called opening the cork on bottles of wine. <laughs> Getting pretty good at it. But think, bang. So that bicep could be like, oh great, I get to pull and twist. Okay? So here, this would be, it's wrapped It would be unwrapped and right there. Mm-hmm. And the intent is for you to see when it got longer, that's when it wrapped around. And when it got shorter, that's when it unwrapped. Let's do an application question. You don't need your bicep in this position. You don't need your bicep to pronate you, but you need your bicep to supinate you. Does that make sense? There's no external force trying to make me do this. So I'm going to use my pronator teres, my pronator quadratus, but there's nothing trying to supinate me. So I have to take this and pull the string. <laughs> That's why you feel it. Make sense? So the bicep breaks down into pieces. What a great question. The biceps break up because it's not on this picture. And but I didn't put it on this picture. And thank you for, for having this. I didn't put it on this picture because then you wouldn't see where it's pulled on. I, I wanted to show the exposed tuberosity of where it's pulling on. So the bicep is yanking. May I? Yeah. The bicep is yanking here. So when you wrap, it's trying to unwrap. Okay. Perfect. Do you mind if I put that on over here real quick? Do you want, do you want, do you want? But I remember that's why I did it was because if, if I left it on this picture, then I couldn't show you the little bony prominence that it's yanking on. So the bicep is yanking on the, that little bony prominence right there. And so when you pronate, that bony prominence gets wrapped under. Think of it. It goes prone, and the bicep's going to unwrap it. Just like my little boys used to have this little game where you, you had this little spinning thing and you yank it and it would spin and then Beyblade, I think it was called. 
That's kind of what the, the bicep's doing. The bicep is like pulling on the big leg and spinning. You would need pronators to make you pronate, then you would need supernators to make you supernate. Yeah, there's no extra force. An analogy for this, great clarification question. Thank you for asking it. If your elbow is just resting on the table and there's nothing trying to flex it and extend me, I need extensors to make me extend and I need flexors to make me flex. And nothing trying to flex me or extend me. So I gotta use strings that do this to do that, and I gotta use strings that do this to do Helpful. That's uh, I think so. All right, Ricky, if we're ready, else we're going to come back to you. Let's knock out the rest of the easy ones. So remember, I said that you have a quad at your knee and you have a quad at your elbow. The quad at your elbow is the three heads of your tricep and this guy, the acromion's muscle. Why is it an elbow extensor? Because it crosses the elbow posteriorly. It's going from humerus to ulna. Not a pronator or a supinator because of that fact. And again, I just think this is so cool that our patella is just that big electron, but just snapped in a bowl so that you can have a rotation at the knee. I just think that's just really, really cool. Because remember, our tibia rotates about the femur. In this case, our fibula would be like our radius, and our tibia would be like our ulna. Oh, You guys know this with triceps. I have one big picture to show you how all the heads come together. Um, do y'all remember for the rectus abdominis how we had this big tendinous inscription that kind of transferred forces from one side to the other side, right? That's what the white stuff is. If you ever see a picture of the tricep and there's just a lot of white tendon, because you, you have a coming together of all these different forces. So for your tricep, you're going to have a medial head, a lateral head. Guys, we have precedent. Vastus medialis, vastus lateralis, right? And then you're going to have this long head, which is would be the equivalency of our rectus femoris, or something that crosses, or a semi-member node, right? Just something that crosses both. No, the, the best analogy would be the quad, because, one, I told you that, but medialis, lateralis, medial head, lateral head. And then the rectus crossed into the hip, the long head of the tricep crosses into the shoulder. Just like the long head of the biceps femoris crossed into the shoulder, I mean crossed into the hip, the long head of the triceps and the long head of the biceps. And look what, look what I did. There's the medial head on the inside, lateral head on the outside, and then our long head that crosses into the shoulder. Now it won't be an exact, because again, even though there are similarities, there's a lot of differences. These hip muscles, when they cross, they have something on top to cross into. That shoulder is articulating. There's, there's kind of nothing, I say nothing, but, but the socket is, take a right hand turn. <laughs> like for the hip, the socket was on top as well as on the side, right? That big acetabulum. For our shoulder, our socket is here. So that's why those muscles kind of you kind of take a right hand turn to hook on to the socket. Extension pullers, right? Tricep and inconius extension pullers. What you got? There is a special that inconius can um, work myself. That's when the tricep is pissed off. <laughs> yeah. Um, so the so the, the enconius is, you know, the tricep is the, the 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 major player, but that's why you have redundancy. That's why you have insurance policies. Um, when I was an athletic trainer, and I remember one time, uh, a, one of my athletes had a bruised, um, he had a bruised shoulder. So because that muscle was bruised. 
other secondary muscles had to take over and do more of kind of that job, right? So even though the Anconius isn't necessarily like the biggest point scorer, if your tricep hurts itself in the game here in Kona, it's like, dude, this is my, my chance. To... So it's kind of like one of those things. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. What it works as an elbow extensor. All right, guys. Good old break your radiators. I'm saving this one for last. And and keep in mind, we're gonna do the, the plan is to do some practice stuff on Friday. But because we missed that day before the test, I need you guys to really go and watch some of those old lectures just to kind of get a, because some of those lectures have practice and stuff, right? Break your radialis. Break your part of the arm. Crosses the elbow in the front. Inserts on the radius. Yeah, so radius, we know. This muscle does not cross into the wrist. It gets close. That radiostyloid, very close. Some athletic trainers and healthcare professionals misfunction the brachioradialis because one of our reflex tests is a brachioradialis reflex test where we're actually looking for a snap of the thumb. But that's the whip of a towel. So what I mean by that is when you do the reflex test, the reflex is to cause flexion. Well, guess what? The distal end is going to whip. Does that make sense? So people may think that it's a radio deviator, but it's just, it's just like a tail flicking <laughs> in the wind, right? The momentum of everything is coming up. And so that last part is going to flick, but it does not cross the wrist. So that's why it can't have function. All right, what I want to show you first is that in a semi-prone position, that muscle has no obliquity. It has no, this is a word I invented, but I think it helps. It has no spirality. It has no rotational pull. It has no transverse pull We are when we are semi-prone. In other words, that muscle crosses that elbow and goes straight to that radius, and it has no rotational pull at the radial ulna joint. I'd like for you to think of it like this. In a semi-prone position, it's as straight up and down as our rectus abdominis is. But as we know, anatomical position is not semi-prone. Anatomical position is supine. So in essence, what we're doing is we're taking a muscle that has no obliqueness to it and we're giving it obliqueness in both directions. How I like to teach the brachioradialis function is to divide radial on the joint motion, full range of motion into two quadrants. Quadrant one is going to be anatomical position to semi-prone, 90 degrees. Quadrant two is semi-prone to fully prone. Let me show you what I just did here with our exercise. Right? Quadrant one is from here to there, and quadrant two is there to over here. A to B. B to C. If I had a string attached to the top of this bottle, does it make sense that a pronation puller would only pull up until I'm midway? It can't push me down and it can't push me down this way. <laughs> like it can only pull up until it has no more obliquity. It has no more obliqueness it's like saying this left sternocleidomastoid is trying to pull me to right until i get all the way to the right now it's just running up and down in quadrant one the brachioradialis is a pronation puller 
up to midway, up to semi-prone. At a semi-prone, there's no more obliquity. It's just straight. Why on your circle is brachioradialis a pronator? Because that's what anatomical position is. You're in quadrant one in anatomical. So if you notice, and I'm going to get to some examples. I know we only have three minutes, but let me get as much time as I can because this is typically is confusing. Look at this note that I added for you guys. Note, at the radiola joint, brachioradialis is a pronation pull from anatomical to right before semi-pronated position because when you're in a semi-pronated position, it's not trying to pull any way but up. Brachioradialis doesn't function at the radial only joint in a semi-pronated position. The only thing, if I had a string here, the only thing that string would do here is to pull it up. It's not trying to... <laughs> but if the bottle, let me show that again, if this was straight up, the string would only try to do this. But if the bottle was tilted this way, the string could try to pronate it. And if the bottle was pulled this way, the string could try to supinate. Does that make sense? So this would be anatomical position. This would represent my thumb. Pronation puller to midway. And a supination puller when I'm in quadrant two. When you say it doesn't function at the radio only joint in a semi-pronated position, meaning like once it's semi-pronated, it's not enough. It can't pull. It can't. It can't pull in a direction of either pronation or supination. That that would be like saying um, pronator teres quadratus. All those guys can can pull in a full range of motion. But this muscle, because it comes in at an angle, because it comes in at an angle with anatomical, but it's not at an angle when I'm here. It's straight to the radius. Ooh, here's a better way to think of it, guys. I think this will really help. Look, guys, watch this. Watch this. Watch. Here, short distance. When I do this, this distance got longer. When I do this, that distance got longer. That means it can pull up until it gets to its shortest position. It can pull up until it gets to its shortest position. But in this position, that muscle can't push me down. It can only pull me up. I think the easiest way to start off with is in quadrant one, it's a pronation pull. And in quadrant two, it's a supination pull. Meaning in quadrant one, his buddies, pronator teres, pronator quadratus. But in quarter two, his buddies are supinator biceps break high. I think to me that's the easy, easiest way to start off with. Quarter one, pronation pull. Quarter two, supination pull. You got a bunch in the body, but it's the only one I'm holding you accountable for with the pectoralis major. We'll get to that in the shoulder because I have to introduce you to how muscles can switch function. That's why when you do a piriformis stretch, you have to flex to switch its function as an external rotator to an internal rotator. So that way, when you externally rotate, you're stretching it. So I'm not holding you accountable to all, but I've got to introduce you to a couple obvious or, or to a couple that I think we can understand best. All right, guys, come prepared on Friday to practice. And uh, if we're done with the practice, then I might move on to some new stuff.